Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining um, tonight's seminar, tonight's web series. Um, this is We Can Do Hard Things in Huntington's Disease Together, part two, in which we will review and go over um, some things um, that are you know, going to be a review of what we talked about the during the first installation of this series, and then also go into some new material, which I which I will talk about. Um, just to introduce myself again to those people that maybe were not present at the first part of this series, my name is Jocelyn. I am a palliative care specialist and a movement disorders neurologist at Stanford. Um, at Stanford, I am. Uh, a neuropalliative specialist. So I have my own outpatient palliative clinic that is really dedicated to the needs of people and families living with a serious neurological illness. Um, and in that setting, I also collaborate with the Huntington's Disease Clinic there. Um, I'll pass it off to my colleagues and co-conspirators who are also um, co-hosting this web series with me. Um, Lisa? Hi, my name is Lisa Mooney, and I am the social worker for Huntington's disease at the uh, UC Davis Center of Excellence, as well as the Northern California chapter. So some of you may or may not have seen me before, but happy to be here. And thank you, Jocelyn. You are doing much of the heavy lifting. And uh, we, of course, so appreciate you. And I'm so excited we got to do this uh, for our patients and families. Mara. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Mara uh, Sefri. My official title is I am a genetic counselor coordinator at Kaiser Permanente. I run the genetic movement disorder clinic there. Um, and I also have the lovely opportunity to work with uh, Lisa at UC Davis on Fridays, where I work with people who are um, new to the HD diagnosis or considering predictive testing. And uh, I've, like Lisa, I'm super grateful that. Uh, Jocelyn has agreed to sort of do these webinars for our families because um, she's awesome, <laughs> as you will about as you are about to see. <laughs> oh my gosh! Well, thank you to Lisa and Mara for those kind words, and I wanted to just say out loud that this is a small group that we have this evening. So I think you know we have the capability of having some discussion back and forth. Um, so if at any point in time. Um, you have a question, feel free to, to raise your hand in the Zoom if um, you would like to use that functionality. You can also place your questions in the chat in real time. Uh, Lisa and Mara will be helping me monitor the chat to see if there are any questions that appear. And of course, we will have time at the end of today's uh, web series for additional questions. Um, even though the running time is until 730, that was really to provide really ample time and in, in case, you know, we really got into the weeds and there's you know, a furious debate, <laughs> but also I'd be very happy to give you back some minutes in your evening time um, in case this does not take up that entire time, which is, it's not likely to be, uh, to do just from the presentation alone. Um, I think that's all of the logistics that I wanted to go over. Um, so I'm gonna get started. So, um, today, we will cover the following topics. Um, we'll do a quick overview of the part one of this series. Um, just a few slides to, to catch you up since it was a couple months ago, or maybe you didn't have a chance to attend that series. Um, then we will go into a section in which we will cover advanced symptom management uh, for common symptoms that many people may encounter um, in mid-stage Huntington's disease. Specifically, the ones we'll focus on uh, will be pain, swallowing changes, bowel changes, loss of balance and falling, and weight loss. I certainly want to say that there are many, many other kinds of symptoms that people often do experience. Um, and we, we definitely have time, I think, left over today to go over any that you may have questions about. But the reason that I chose these is not to imply that they're the only ones that people experience, but they are the ones we decided to use this kind of time and space to focus on. 
And finally, we'll, we'll wrap up with um, giving all of you an opportunity to register for the remainder of this web series or also to look at the QR code to look at the replay for the part one of the series as well. To take us back just through a brief overview of the part one of this web series, really in that part one, we went over an introduction to palliative care. Um, and, and that really can help ground us in tonight's talk as well. Um, as a review, palliative care is a medical specialty that focuses on quality of life. Palliative care uses a team approach to highlight the many different aspects of life that can be affected by a serious illness. As you can see by uh, this uh, picture on the right, um, we can understand that someone at the center of their care might be the person and their family members. And then there are many aspects of their life that might be affected by their illness. So that can be physical changes, the practical, practical aspects of life, the spiritual or existential pieces of life, um, and also the mind, the psychological and emotional aspects of life. Palliative care is available to all people living with a serious illness. That means at any age and any stage, that's a really important piece of palliative care that I think is the number one asked question um, that I often get as a palliative care specialist. Um, people wonder if they have to have a certain prognosis um, or a limited lifespan to really be able to benefit from palliative care. Um, and I just want to say and emphasize that palliative care is really available for people at any age, any stage, and any prognosis. Palliative care includes those not limited to hospice care, which is, you know, the second most common question that I definitely answer in clinic. Um, we have not delved deeply into hospice care um, in this web series yet. Um, as a hint, that is going to be, I think, the the meat of what we tackle in part three of this web series. Suffice to say for now, hospice is a, is a small part of palliative care and all palliative care specialists are trained in hospice care and can speak on it knowledgeably. Um, however, I just want to say that palliative care and hospice are not exactly the same thing, though they often are conflated. To go over the definition of palliative care, again, that we went over in part one. Um, number one, palliative care is specialized health care for people living with a serious illness. And, and to clue us into what we're going to talk about today, this type of care is focused on providing relief from the symptoms and the stress of the illness. And again, it can't be said anymore since it is the absolute center of our work. The goal is to improve quality of life for both the patient and the family. Often when you join a palliative care visit, you might see more than a single person there to meet you. Um, palliative care likes to take a team-based approach, and that means that you might meet with a whole team when you meet with a palliative care uh, clinic. Um, one of the main uh, team members is the doctor and the nurse, the medical team. Um, uh, the doctors and the nurses may prescribe medications, manage bothersome symptoms. They might also help people and their families navigate difficult decisions, um, and they may help coordinate your care with other doctors. The social workers can provide emotional support, uh, caregiver support, can try to help you access medical equipment to navigate the complicated financial questions that people often have when they're living with a serious illness in our very complicated healthcare system. Chaplains are the third member of a palliative care team. They often provide spiritual and existential support. Um, they can help people face their existential concerns and questions such as you know, why is this happening to me and how do I make sense of it now? 
To rewatch part one, you can scan this QR code to watch the recording of that web series. Um, for those who are joining for the first time and maybe watching this recording, I would recommend starting with the first recording so that you have the context um, to maybe understand the discussion from this point on. Again, to return to that holistic approach to symptoms. Um, when we think about you know, a person, we do know in palliative care, we focus on the fact that when someone is living with a serious illness, there's more than just the physical symptoms. There's more than just the body that can suffer. Uh, so unlike a cardiologist who might focus on the heart or your kidney doctor who focuses on how just your kidneys are doing, when a palliative care doctor thinks about symptoms, we try to think about all the ways in which the, all aspects of life are affected by that symptom. So in terms of you know, relief from symptoms, you know, these are just some of the symptoms that we're gonna discuss today in black, like I mentioned when we opened today. Um, but the list of symptoms for people living with Huntington's disease can include many more um, than the ones that we see here. I just put them on there to, again, open up to, to just say out loud and to admit there's no way we could probably talk about every single symptom that people experience, but we'll just be focusing on some of the main ones for today, the ones in black. So I was gonna start with our first case, which is about pain. Um, I can read this first one. Um, in the following cases, I might ask one of uh, the people attending or maybe my co-host to, to help um, read the cases. So it's not just me and my boring voice you have to listen to for the next 45 minutes. Um, for, for case one, Tom has been feeling more pain um, when taking neighborhood walks with his walker. He has arthritis in both knees. His balance has worsened over time. He has been spending more time sitting and lying down on his favorite recliner in front of the TV. His lower back feels pain when he gets up in the morning. His back pain feels like soreness, and he often feels like there's a burning along his back muscles. His back feels better when his wife massages the area with some lotion. Sometimes his back pain becomes very severe. And when it is that severe, he starts breathing faster, clutching his chest and wondering, is this pain, if the pain is ever going to go away? So I just wanted to open up with a question for the group when we think about Tom and his story. Uh, what are some of the factors? So his kind of personal factors, his his lifestyle choices, his his medical history. What are the, some of those things that are really impacting his pain and his ability to cope with it? If you have any thoughts, feel free to unmute yourself and mm -hmm. put them out there, or you can put them in the chat. I know one thing that I notice with uh, our patients and family is that they experience pain. Um, it, it sort of permeates the whole family, meaning, you know, if someone's in pain, they have a little bit less patience, they're a little bit less able to sort of deal with daily um, challenges that might come along. Um, they're not going out and doing things as much because they're, you know, they're afraid of getting hurt or, or not feeling good or being stuck somewhere and feeling a lot of pain. Um, so it definitely impacts the whole family because if someone doesn't want to go to the family function or whatever, then it kind of creates some tension there. So. Yeah, I love, I love what, you know, your vignette, Lisa, because it really highlights actually some of the things that we're going to talk about. And what I also hear in that is, you know, how much pain is connected to all aspects of life, but particularly how it influences our thoughts and our fears and our worries and our mood. Um, so pain definitely, it's, it's one of those primal 
sensations that we all experience. It's meant to give us information about the situations are in, that we're in. So very, you know, reasonably, so it grabs our attention. It really does color the experience that we have of our lives in many different ways. Some of the things that, you know, I tend to think about when I meet someone in my clinic who's mentioning, you know, a fair bit of pain, especially musculoskeletal pain, that really common low back pain that a lot of people have to live with. We think about what happens over time as we do spend more time sitting or lying in bed. Naturally, you know, the body is functioning at its best when we are moving around and we're as active and as independent as possible. And it's very natural that over time or in the setting of an illness, if you are less active and your muscles are less robust and they're, you're not getting as much exercise as you used to, the muscles shrink over time. And that places a little bit more stress on your joints um, when you are trying to walk around and be active. So this is something that in the medical world, we have a name for, it's called deconditioning. Um, certainly, right? In Tom's story, he has lower back pain, which is, you know, a diagnosis unto itself. So there are a lot of medical conditions that are not related to Huntington's disease that can lead to pain. Um, but they certainly can be affected by the Huntington's disease and the symptoms related to that. So they can all kind of interplay with one another. One thing that I wanted to kind of draw out here, which is a little bit of a, a thread that someone like me, like a pain specialist would really, really pay attention to. There are different kinds of pain that people can really experience. Um, so one of them we tend to think of as nociceptive pain. And this is the kind of pain that you would get if you banged your arm against uh, a stairwell. Um, it's sharp. It really just hurts. It just feels like pain. Sometimes it's like a soreness, like a muscle soreness. And then there's a kind of neuropathic pain or what I tend to translate to be called nerve pain. This kind of nerve pain is usually described a little bit differently. People call it like burning tingling, the ants crawling sensation on the skin, feeling like there's kind of lightning even moving through their body or through their face, um, this kind of electricity-like sensation. And these kinds of different categories of pain um, can have a different kind of impact on your day-to-day -day life and their management with medications is a little different. So as a palliative care, you know, doctor, when I'm talking to someone, I'm trying to get a sense like what type of pain, what kind of flavor of pain do they have? Um, because it helps us figure out, you know, what kind of plan might be most helpful for them. I think anxiety associated with pain is really, really common. Um, and it's highlighted in this story as well as in Lisa's vignette too. Um, if we think of pain as a way that the body is meant to take in information about what's going on to tell you, don't touch the hot stove, don't cut your finger, don't fall down the stairs, then the kind of anxiety that you necessarily develop when you develop, you know, pain is also really useful because it also tells you, okay, next time I don't want to do that thing that's going to make me feel this way. Um, the difficult part of the anxiety is that anxiety can then drive pain and make the experience of pain even worse. And for people living with chronic pain, meaning pain that's not really providing a useful piece of information anymore, it's just there. It's just something you have to cope with. Then the kind of anxiety that's also driven and driving the pain um, can also create a lot of a lot of difficulty for people because it really impacts what they feel comfortable doing, what they'll sign up to do later on, and how much they can really participate in the activities that bring them satisfaction and meaning. So what is the palliative care approach to pain? So here I'm going to summarize 
probably an entire lecture series and a few bullet points, but suffice to say, we're going to break it down to the essentials. So much like we just did, right? Like a palliative care approach is to really take into stock all of the different things that might be going on in someone's body, in someone's lifestyle and day-to-day -day life, in their whole medical history that might be explaining or painting the picture of why they are experiencing pain in this way, in this moment, in this period of time for them. Um, and, and that's so that we have that full picture. So it's not just, I feel pain, I give you a pain medication. It's really thinking about the context in which the pain is happening. This is the most important piece, I think, in any conversation um, when we think about pain management. Um, often when I meet people in clinic, you know, I, I really want to get to know them as people, right? I don't want to just diagnose them with a diagnosis and give them medications based on that. And, and analogously, when we think about trying to treat pain, it's important for your providers to get to know you and your day-to-day -day life. How is this symptom of pain getting in the way of your very unique and full life? Is it getting in the way of you being able to go out to dinner with your family? Is it the kind of pain that's keeping you up at night because you can't get comfortable? Um, that way, your provider, when they're helping you manage that pain, you'll, be, you'll all have a sense of what the shared goals might be. So that when you come back after we've tried something, we can say, so how is your sleep going now that we tried doing this thing to help with your pain? Or how often have you made it out to dinner with your family now that we've had this plan in place? And, and that's how usually we build the, the kind of plan that we have to treat pain. I say explicitly to people often, I wish that we could have a silver billet that's going to take away all pain for the rest of your life. <laughs> Certainly, if I had that, I would give it to you in this moment. And, and we have to reckon with the fact that, you know, that may not always be possible, um, that we're not able to eliminate all pain. But if we can build a list of what's most important in your pain management for you and what are your goals in terms of your function and your day-to-day -day life, those are things that your palliative care team or whichever team you're working with can really try to prioritize. One thing that I might think about as a palliative care provider, if I were working with Tom, would be how can we give Tom kind of more tools to help him cope with the pain? Because if I, we reflect back to the story, Tom was, you know, certainly feeling sometimes that it could feel better if he got some massage from his wife, but sometimes the pain would make him start to breathe faster and make him start to worry about when it's going to end. So in those moments, what are the kinds of behavioral or, or even just cognitive strategies that we can use to help people breathe through that moment? and get through that moment so that their life is as little affected by the pain as possible. There are actually a lot of different kinds of cognitive, uh, cognitive behavioral techniques that have been tested in the clinical setting in a doctor's office or in a therapist's office that can teach people self-soothing breathing or even self-soothing kind of thoughts to help anchor themselves and ground themselves so that they're not as carried away by the anxiety that can make pain and the experience of pain a lot worse. Um, and then there's also the sense of what are the things you can do in your day-to-day -day life that actually might also help just as much as a pill. So often thinking about different temperatures because often musculoskeletal skeletal pain will respond to heat or to cold, thinking about massage as well, applying kind of pressure, which is often very soothing as well, thinking about topical agents. There's a long list of things that we can think of that are not just taking a medication that can also be very effective in helping with pain. 
Um, of course, that brings us to thinking about medications. Um, when I mentioned before that there are different kinds of categories of pain, nociceptive or neuropathic, this is where we tie it back to that, that piece of, of history and information. Different types of pain often respond to different categories of medication. So as a palliative care provider, if someone has a nerve type pain, I will often explore their options within the class of medications that I think really target nerve pain um, before I reach for other kinds of medications. And again, it can't be emphasized enough, you know, especially for Tom, who's experiencing what sounds like a, you know, a physical manifestation of anxiety when that pain is there, I want to make sure that I help him name out loud that the pain is driving these anxious feelings as well and this worry. And I want to make sure that we're talking about the anxiety and that worry as well, that addressing pain and addressing anxiety are sometimes the same conversation. So we'll move on to case two. Um, could I nominate Lisa to, to read this case for us? <clears throat> yes, I can do that. Um, swallowing, ch swallowing challenges. Janice has been experiencing some intermittent coughing while drinking water. It comes and goes. She tries her best to take small sips at a time, though sometimes it feels more difficult to coordinate the amount of water or food that she takes in all at one time. Sometimes Janice feels like she has too much saliva, which causes her to cough. She has some intermittent, intermittent, uh, language is hard for me tonight, involuntary movements of her face. Janice notices more coughing when she is chatting with her friends over lunch and when she is snacking while watching TV in her recliner chair. In Thank you, Lisa. Anyone have any thoughts about this scenario or situation? Yeah, now that you all know the drill, Kind of what we'll think about now, thinking about Janice is like, what are the things that you notice in her story that are maybe impacting her swallowing? While you think on that, I can go through a few. So the involuntary movements, which, you know, many of you probably know um, in the medical jargon, we call chorea, which is a very characteristic movement that we see in Huntington's disease. Um, certainly involuntary movements of the parts of the face, the mouth and the throat that are involved with swallowing can interfere with the act of swallowing. There are also the swallowing changes that can be related to Huntington's disease, may not be related to chorea, but are actually related to progression of the disease itself. Some people with Huntington's also, you know, because they have so much energy and verve, sometimes they can become impulsive with eating or they can eat very, very quickly or eat a very large amount. And if you're giving yourself a little bit less time to get everything down, that can also lead to additional challenges with swallowing. We had one of the participants uh, mention she's also multitasking, uh, you know, watching TV and eating at the same time what we consider multitasking and possibly not sitting up while she's eating, which can, can be contributing to some of the challenges. Absolutely. I think I have a couple of those there. So definitely doing several things while eating so that she might not be paying attention to how her swallowing is managing the food. Um, and also her position lying flat while eating. It's typically more difficult to swallow um, without the help of gravity. Usually the swallow mechanism works best when we try to give it its best success, which means let gravity pull it down in the right direction. Um, and the only other thing might be the excessive saliva, um, which she, for Janice had, you know, Janice had noticed was a, an issue for her and is a common uh, symptom in Huntington's disease. Not everyone I've worked with living with Huntington's disease has the excessive saliva, but when it is there, um, it can just 
be more that you have to manage and deal with. So when we think about what are the palliative care approaches to these swallowing changes, um, definitely working closely with speech and language pathology therapists who are like the swallow therapists. They are the people in the world who know the most and are most deeply um, uh, experts in how a swallow is supposed to happen um, and all the different ways it can be affected by different illnesses. So really, when I put this together, I even shared my slides with one of the swallow therapists that I work with because they are they are the end all and the be all. So really working closely with them and making sure that you're, you know, in close contact with them so they can give you kind of a sense of what they think the major challenges in your swallow are. That's really important, I think, first and foremost. I also think it's important because I had a patient actually just last week kind of confused about what a speech therapist does mm. because it says speech and language. And so, you know, of course, some people can just assume that they're you know, just helping you get words out and with speech. Um, but uh, like Jocelyn was saying, no, they help a lot more with the swallowing. The same muscles we use to talk are the same muscles we use to swallow. So if you're having difficulty in one area, it's probably also contributing to difficulty in swallowing and or um, finding your words or getting your words out. And there's lots of mechanics and uh, as the other person said, multitasking when it comes to swallowing. And that's where a speech and language pathologist uh, therapist can help you with those things because they can look at the mechanics and see what muscles are doing the right thing in that scenario or what muscles are not working as well. And they can give you um, exercises and different things to do to strengthen those areas so that maybe uh, you'll be able to minimize any of the choking or coughing or difficulties you might be experiencing. Yeah. I was just going to chime in about speech therapists too, because I think they're the coolest occupation because not only deal with articulation issues, swallowing, which then they can do all these swallow studies as well, but then they also work with people around cognitive rehab as well. They're really amazing professionals. So they really do so much <laughs> and often you know they they can provide so much incredible insight for so many uh, so many people living with huntington's disease from multiple perspectives much like you both just outlined and um, we talked a little bit about swallow tests so there definitely are like objective diagnostic tests that we can do and the speech therapists and the swallow therapists often will do to really try to get as much information about what's going on with their swallow. Um, they can give you advice about how to modify your diet so that your swallowing is as successful as possible. They can give you advice about what kinds of positions your swallow seems to benefit the most from. Um, again, like Lisa and Mara are saying, they can talk to you about compensatory strategies. So knowing that these set of muscles don't work as well, maybe you should try doing this. So they give a lot of practical advice as well. They can also give a lot of advice to families um, who might be, you know, really trying to monitor um, someone's eating just to give them a sense like, you know, what should you look out for? Um, so they give a lot of great anticipatory guidance. Um, and the swallow, the speech, language, and pathology, the swallow therapist, they all can discuss what are the pros and cons of alternative ways of feeding yourself or getting the nutrition that you typically need. And they can often give you some guidance um, along with, you know, your medical team about whether these different methods make sense in the context of your own goals, your own hopes and worries. This often becomes a hot topic um, when we start to think about alternative ways of getting nutrition. Um, for example, I, I frequently get asked in clinic or during these talks about, you know, feeding tubes and whether those are something that people universally get in Huntington's disease. Um, Mara, Lisa, I don't know how much has come up for you in your practice as well. Um, I, I would say that we talk to people um, as they start getting to the place where they're choking a lot and maybe their swallow study says that they're aspirating, you know, what's the path that you want to go down with this? 
you know, and it's difficult discussions and difficult conversation, right? Because it's around, do you want to let nature take its course? And potentially we're talking about somebody aspirating and potentially passing from aspiration pneumonia um, or needing lots of treatment around that. Or do you want to consider doing some kind of intervention where you'll feel, feed your loved one, not through their mouth, um, you know? And I I know, well, people have strong feelings about this, you know, ahead of time. They think, you know, I don't want to be put on a feeding tube or I don't want to, you know, and I'm surprised how many people have a different perspective once they're actually in the situation. And I've had a lot of families that say, thought they weren't going to do it, but then when their loved ones still seemed able to be enjoying life, but they were just hungry and they couldn't, um, and they were losing a lot of weight and they used the the tube, suddenly their loved one was perking back up, enjoying, you know, and so I've seen it go all ways. Yeah, I was going to add that too, of just, you know, what you want or value at one point in your life can change as life experiences happen and progresses for sure. The other thing that I like to talk to families about is um, just because someone has chosen to move forward with a feeding tube doesn't mean that they can't do some eating for that's not always the case that they can do that. But um, but a lot of times, especially with Huntington's, they can still have some foods for you know, pleasure and enjoyment, whether that's ice cream or different things. Um, usually a feeding tube is because, you know, they really can't take in enough nutrition um, to maintain, um, you know, their bodily functioning, um, but they can still have some food for enjoyment. So that's something to talk about too. It's not just, you know, kind of an all or nothing sort of situation. Sometimes we can, you know, help with the nutritional balance, but they can still enjoy food if that's something that's important to them. For sure. Um, can definitely. I... Oh, oh no, no, go ahead. Oh, I was just about to say, um, I think that the, the topic of swallowing and swallowing changes, um, can easily, um, expand into thinking about, you know, what's more important as time is growing shorter right? And thinking about if you knew your time did look shorter for any reason, how would you like to spend that time? And I will say that that will be a big focus of the next um, web series. So in case, you know, we've just only described a little bit of the swallowing changes today, want to make make you feel rest assured we're going to go into that in more detail. But uh, Kay, I think you had a question. Is that right? Well, I just wanted to say, like with all of these things, like you, you, can't know until you're in the circumstance what it's feeling like. I mean, so I totally agree about that. But as a um, as a physician and somebody who worked on ethics consults where we dealt with really complicated and bad situations where people maybe um, were really suffering at the end of their life, and it, just that there was a lot of conflict with family or with doctors, I really saw the importance of trying to broach these difficult conversations early. Not that you can definitely know like the definitive answer or how it's gonna go, but the more times you have the conversation, the more you explore the nuances of it and you sort of see what the, the pros and cons and the values are. But also the earlier in someone's disease, the more cognitively intact they are and more able to understand and participate in the conversations. And so even though it feels too early some of the time, I think broaching, the, broaching it with people earlier when they're um, less impacted cognitively is really a gift for them, their families. Thank you for mentioning that, Kate, because I think that's a really important piece. Um, and I wholeheartedly agree with you that having some of these conversations, especially around feeding tubes um, early, and I want to say often, but, you know, it's not like you have to have it every Friday night or something, but, uh, you know, having them periodically throughout, you know, the, the Huntington's journey in this case, um, just to see where people stand and how they feel and do they have the same wishes today as they did, you know, two years ago or three years ago and, you know, how are they feeling about things and, you know, is there something more either their care team can do or family can do to help support them and, um, you know, make sure that their wishes are met.
Thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kay, again for for mentioning that. I I do, um, you know, completely agree with everything that's been shared. Um, and and just in the spirit of time, I'm going to move on from this. I know we'll definitely have you know a more thorough discussion at our next series, um, as it is definitely a really really important topic and one that you know can have a lot of complexity and nuance, much like we've mentioned. So moving on to case three, um, who would like to read this one? Oh, I'll read the bowel changes. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, really? She's going to give me bowel changes? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but this is Thank this you. is a real thing because I, I have a patient I'm working with right now who's really struggling with this stuff. Um, so bowel changes. Over the past year, Casey has started having more issues with his bowel movements. He used to have a regular BM every morning with his coffee. Now he may go three days without a bowel movement, followed by two days of diarrhea. Sometimes he needs to go so suddenly that he's worried he won't make it to the toilet. He's never had an accident. His mother has noticed, though, that Casey has stopped leaving the house to meet with friends because he's worried about finding a public bathroom. Yeah. So thank you, Mara, for reading that. As everyone knows, not the most glamorous symptom, even in a list of not so glamorous <laughs> symptoms. And yet at the same time, we all know, right, these bodily functions, our bowels have a big impact on quality of life huge, huge. So I'm going to say bowel movements many times in the next five minutes. And by the end, you will be completely used to and feel free to talk about them with all of your providers now. I'm very, very confident in that. Um, so when we think about Casey's story, some of the things that come up for me when I think about um, the factors impacting these changes. So I'm wondering, is, is Casey drinking fluids? Is he dehydrated? Often that is the number one reason that people start noticing changes to their bowel rhythm as they get older. Um, I think about, you know, what is this person eating and putting into their gut? Um, definitely what we eat and the composition of our diet can also have an influence on our bowels. And as we kind of mentioned, sometimes there can be some changes in our eating habits in Huntington's disease. And sometimes there can be a change in the preferences in what we like to eat in Huntington's disease, which can then have an impact. I know that some of my patients tend to like eating sugary things, kind of fattier things, and that can have like a indirect impact on just how your bowels may change. Um, something we noticed with Casey, which is really common, is the fact that he's having constipation, so not having enough bowel movements, as well as diarrhea, having too many. And often when people tell me they have the, this, con this, this pair of symptoms, they tell me, well, I don't really know what to do because I'm worried if I take anything that's going to help me go, it's going to make my diarrhea a lot worse. Um, and then they can fall into this cycle of no bowel movement, too many, none, too many. He kind of mentioned also that he's feeling the sense of urgency, meaning that suddenly the, the urge, the desire, the sense that you got to get to the bathroom right away starts so suddenly and so ferociously that it makes people worried they're not going to make it. Um, good on Casey. It seems like he hasn't had an accident, but it does sound like this urgency is impacting his day-to-day -day life. For example, he's less, you know, you know, he's feeling more apprehensive of leaving the home because of it. And that's a really, really common kind of indirect impact on someone's life that that bowel urgency can have. There are also many other common medical causes that can lead to bowel movement changes. Just because you have Huntington's disease and it can present with bowel rhythm changes doesn't mean it has to be just the Huntington's disease. So always trying to take a step back and take a bird's eye view to say, is there anything else that might be going on and making sure has a primary care doctor seen you recently? Um, have we thought about the common things, medical conditions that can also lead to bowel movement changes? Have we thought about those? And then finally, after all of that, we can say, okay, what are the kinds of changes that are just going to be put under this vast umbrella 
of neurologic neurogenic bowel that means that the bowel changes are due to the Huntington's disease itself. So when I work as a palliative care, you know, approach, I think about what are the most important activities in this person's life, again, that might be affected by the symptom. For Casey, it might be getting out of the house, keeping connected with his friends, ensuring that he's still integrated into the community that's important to him. I think about the easy things that we can change, meaning drinking more fluids, making sure people are not dehydrated, making sure that their diet composition, you know, helps them to have bowel movements. Um, I'm not a nutritionist or a dietitian, so often I will, you know, even look up, you know, recipes to help with bowel movements um, and then share them with patients. Um, there's also just, you know, powdered Metamucil or psyllium powder that you can buy by the vet at Costco. If you put that in a tall glass of water, you're automatically just getting more fiber in. And for a lot of people that can just help with regularity of bowel movements too. Um, again, very important, right? There are many other medical conditions, anything from say, you know, uh, you know, an underlying bowel disease to a tumor that can also cause bowel changes. And I don't say tumor to, to scare people, but just to let you know, if there's something going on with your bowels and it's relatively new for you, it's still something you should talk about with your primary care doctor. We can treat constipation aggressively. And this is when I'm going to get back to that cycle between constipation and diarrhea. When we think about that person that I kind of brought up who said, oh, I'm worried about taking too much because it's going to make me have diarrhea when diarrhea is already a problem. Often people can develop this kind of symptom called overflow diarrhea, where they that, that actually starts to happen because they are so constipated that they are basically impacted, meaning the stool is not moving forward. And the only kind of output that they have is the liquid diarrhea around the impacted stool. So even though it seems like they have too much going on because there's only liquid diarrhea coming out, the underlying problem is that they're just very, very constipated. And so for these people, I often say, let's try to Try to introduce something gentle into your day to day so you have at least a small solid bowel movement every day with the hope that we can kind of chip down at that chronic constipation over time. Some other simple but you know very effective things to help with urgency can be sticking to a schedule. So meaning picking a few times a day, even if you don't feel like going sitting down for a set period of time, not too long, not straining and just relaxing <laughs> and giving your body a moment in time to have a bowel movement if it happens. And if it doesn't happen, you can leave, but it might happen. So giving it that chance to, to relieve itself so that you're not kind of caught unawares if you urgently have to go later. There are also some really common tricks um, that primary care doctors can also talk to you about. Um, often the most successful bowel movements are the ones that you time upon waking, especially if you have some food in your stomach in the morning or a warm drink. For many people that actually stimulates a reflex so they can have a bowel movement on a more kind of routine basis. Positioning is always also really important. So if any of you have seen those squatty potties that are available that can help you kind of position your legs so that it actually helps you have a bowel movement without straining, that can make a big difference for people. And it can't be overemphasized, setting yourself up for success, making sure you're doing this in a place that you feel comfortable that you have some privacy so that your body is as relaxed as possible and you're able to have a successful bowel movement on the schedule that you want. And I would just add that uh, this is a pretty common symptom that that uh, HD persons have, and it can be something that they get very fixated and perseverative on and start thinking about a lot. And I don't blame them because I, the same has happened to me. Um, but, um, you know, as a caregiver or someone who's supporting a person with Huntington's disease, 
you know, telling them that, oh, but you're not going that often or your diary is not that bad or those types of things actually only makes them a little bit more anxious about it. So if you can do some of these things like sticking to a schedule or assuring them that you'll stop every hour or every, you know, whatever it is, you know, at bathrooms that are comfortable and clean. I have many Huntington's families that can tell you like the good bathrooms from the corridor from where they live to the where they go to see their, their, you know, HD team. So there's sort of ways around it. Um, and again, it's not always related due to something else. It could be related to just getting the false messages uh, due to Huntington's or the slowness of messages and, you know, them just feeling like they have the urge, but yet nothing is there to come out. Um, so these are, you know, common things to sort of think about. And it can be very frustrating as a caregiver as well to support someone around this because, like I said, they can get very... Um, you know, stuck sort of on the topic. So it can be very hard, but these are good things to talk to your team about. Believe me, we talk about poop all the time and we are happy to talk about it or bowel movements, I should say. Um, <laughs> um, but anyway, so bring these topics up. The other thing is bowel changes can also contribute, especially if someone is really constipated or having really extreme diarrhea could contribute to pain as well, which would then bring us back to the first scenario. Uh, we also had someone add um, sometimes a walk or some kind of physical activity can get the bowels moving and flowing. And that is 100% true. So exercise and having an exercise routine can really be helpful as well. So this is a common thing with Huntington's is the bowel changes. Yeah, it definitely can be. I know actually maybe between Mara and Lisa and myself, we can all think of some people that we have worked with and families we've worked with for whom this is an issue. I will say it's not necessarily the biggest issue for everyone, um, but it's common enough. And sometimes, you know, I, I think people are often shy enough about it that I wanted to prioritize it to put it on this list so we can put it out there so that people feel like, well, this is something, you know, my my providers and my team are aware of. So maybe it's okay that I kind of talk about it with them. I would say yeah. it's definitely a treatment or definitely a treatment, definitely a topic that we talk about, you know, a fair amount. Believe me, I have, we have clinics every Friday. So I talk about it probably more frequently than some, but um, so it, it is common. Now I also want to warn kind of what Jocelyn mentioned earlier is that we don't want to just automatically blame the changes on Huntington's disease. So it is something that we would really, really encourage you to talk to whatever physician you are most comfortable with, whether it's your HD team or your primary care doctor, but someone that you can talk to so we can make sure that there really isn't something else going on. And then we can feel free to blame it on Huntington's after that and then work through some of this stuff. Um, but is it a symptom that people have? Yes. Is it in the top five symptoms? Probably not, um, but definitely like, you know, the top 15 or so that people experience. <laughs> At what stage of Huntington's does this usually start to be a problem? Um, I think it could occur at any stage, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I would say it usually starts occurring, or at least we start seeing it and talking about it a little bit more frequently, more towards the like middle stage of the disease, um, kind of when things are changing and people are maybe a little less active because their mobility is a little bit more challenging or their um, diet is changing because maybe they're not having you know, three meals a day like they were before, or they're forgetting to eat, um, or they have more medications on board that might be impacting that. Um, so I would say we see it more around the middle stage, or at least we talk about it more around the middle stage. Um, but it can happen at any stage of the disease for sure. One of the people that um, we're working with around GI issues right now, um, has significant um, anxiety. And I think that um, could be contributing to some of those issues as well. Yeah, there's nothing worse than feeling like you're not going to be able to make it to the bathroom and or you're going to have to go, you know, have a big bowel movement in a stranger's bathroom or in a public bathroom. That is terrifying. So yeah, for anxiety, for sure. 
Yeah. It's one of those really important universal bodily functions that we all have. And it's very understandable that if and when it starts to change, right, that can be pretty worrisome or disturbing to people, especially if they haven't really known to expect it or, or really know anyone else in their life that has similar issues. Um, basically, all the scientific studies looking at people with any kind of condition um, that is a serious illness, like bowel health and bowel habits always rises to the top as one of the big components of quality of life. So when it does get affected, it can have such a big impact on quality of life that um, in palliative care, it's definitely something we want to make sure gets addressed. Moving on to case four, I will take this one. Um, this is a case about loss of balance and falling. May has had two falls recently. The first fall happened on the front porch when May was trying to walk down the three steps in front of her house and lost her balance. The second fall happened when May was holding on to a dining chair and she lost her grip because of her chorea. May needed help getting back up, which frightened her. Her daughter, her daughter Christy, has noticed that May's walking looks more clumsy and unsteady. Christy asks May to use a walker, which May sometimes does use and sometimes does not. Mo very common. <laughs> um, May wonders if she should get an electric wheelchair so that she can leave the house and continuing, continue attending church in person. When we think about May and what's going on in her life, what are, what are some of the things that are coming to your mind? I think this is a good case of where there's anxiety on both sides, both anxiety mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. patient, the mm -hmm. person living with Huntington's and mm -hmm. the care provider, mm -hmm. um, because as a care provider, you want to make sure your loved ones are safe and you don't want to have to work. Certainly don't want to get the call when you're at the grocery store or work that, you know, mm -hmm. something happened. And when people are falling and lose, you know, and their mobility or is changing and they're having more challenges. Of course, it's very anxiety provoking and they're worried about loss of independence and how this is going to impact their ability to do the things that they love to do. So yeah. it's um, anxiety provoking for the whole family for different reasons, but for the whole family. Yeah. Huge, huge. I'm just going to put all of these on here so that we can kind of think about them together. Um, um, certainly kind of the you know, the, the cornerstone of it, I always like to tell people, um, is that we do expect people to experience changes in their balance due to Huntington's disease, um, that that is an expected part of the condition. Um, many people wonder, is it the chorea? Is it all the chorea that's leading to the falls that I'm having? Um, just because sometimes the extra movements are the most visible things. And actually, from a neurology perspective, what we notice is that even when people's chorea is pretty well controlled, or even when we're examining people and they happen to be very relaxed and say they're not having very much, um, they still manifest in the middle stages, particularly in moving forward with a loss of that innate balance. And that is due to the changes in the brain due to the disease. Korea can have an impact though. For example, if you have kind of one arm going this direction and another arm going in this direction, it vastly changes your center of gravity. And if your balance is you know, your, your body's way of trying to keep your center gra of gravity as steady as possible. Sometimes if the chorea is too large or really uncontrolled, um, then it can also throw off your center of balance so much that it can, it can worsen falls. I will say in general though, um, when I work with people, it's more common that it's the former. That's the big problem, meaning the innate loss of balance as the disease progresses. Lisa was mentioning, I think, you know, that kind of anxiety that can really start to develop and that kind of care partner, um, care receiver relationship that can develop, especially on the topic of assistive devices. 
meaning walkers or canes or trekking poles, whatever your physical therapist has recommended for you. Very often, it always feels like there's one person in that in that duo that feels like they that the person really needs an assistive device. And then there's another person who really feels like they don't. And it's more often than not the person themselves living with Huntington's who feels like they're actually managing okay, and then probably their care partner, their family member, whomever that may be, who has noticed, okay, the, the walking looks very different to me. It really you know, worries me, and I'm really worried what's going to happen if they fall and I'm not around or if they need help. Um, so the question of which assistive device, whether it's the right one for you, how often you use it, often that can be like the longest and most, you know, kind of nuanced conversation that we have in clinic. Um, and it is really important because some of these assist assistive devices can be really helpful. So sometimes it really can make the difference of whether someone is falling or not, meaning whether they're using their walker regularly or not. I kind of just threw this in here because um, May, you know, kind of put her hand on the dining chair to study herself, but because of the career, she fell. And often people will naturally, when they feel their balance is changing, adapt to that. And part of the adaptation is to kind of surf on different pieces of furniture, kind of going from the chair to the couch to the wall. And this gives them or potentially, you know, their family a sense that they don't need an assistive device. But I like to highlight that they are using the environment around them, surfing on the environment around them to kind of keep them steady. Um, I think I see an upraised hand from Daniela. Please go ahead. Um, yes, I tried a walking device with my husband who has HD. And it turned out, even though I got the easiest to use and lightest one from Walgreens, he didn't have enough strength to use it when he threw out his back and he couldn't <laughs> he couldn't walk so i concluded that really the walkers uh might not be suitable for hd i don't know what what's your opinion but at the same time my husband is very opinionated and very independent um he, he can still go up and down the stairs, though he started to lose balance more often up and down the stairs. So, yeah, I, I just recently bought um, a vintage house, <laughs> um, another house, uh, very small, but it doesn't have stairs for such eventuality because I, I couldn't modify the stairs in the existing house um but it's not only the mobility itself whether they want to use it or not it's um it's or the environment it's how do you convince them to use it <laughs> i mean they need it how do you convince them because i have hard time I think that's a really excellent question, Daniela and Mara and Lisa, if you have any experience and insight, love to, to hear your perspective. I will just say, you know, often the choice of device um, mm -hmm. is something that um, I usually would recommend working with a physical therapist on just because mm -hmm. um, the physical therapist really, it's kind of their job to know what's commercially available and what kind of works best for people on an individual basis. I think whatever's available in your local drugstore in a, in a, in a kind of crisis situation, like you just got to get what you got to get. But over time, um, the physical therapist can give you a better sense of what might be a good fit um, on, a, on a personalized and customized basis. But I'll turn it right. over to the host too. We started to use, um, uh, my husband started to be seen by a physical therapist when we go on Friday to uh, UC Davis Clinic on Fridays uh, twice a year. 
and he has some exercises uh, that he forgets and sometimes I forget because I'm so busy um, but the physical therapy still didn't tell us what I mean our problem is not the lack of devices or where we buy them from just to convince him to use it like like for example the bathroom uh, chair the shower we've been having that for two years now and and he didn't want to use it once <laughs> and and i'm always even though there is somebody there is a backup caregiver that uh, i hire him to help him take a shower i we are always so um so afraid something is going to happen because we can't convince him to to use the chair. We can't convince him to use a walker. <laughs> Convincing him is the problem. This is a very, very, very common issue in Huntington's Disease Clinic. Um, it's one that I spend a lot of my time talking to families about too, especially in my role at Kaiser where I'm the coordinator of the program. Um, and I'm not sure that we ever convince anybody to do it. What we do a lot of times is we have the fricking things at clinic with us. And, you know, at UC Davis, we have a really cool one, actually. At Kaiser, we just have one of those that's in the picture. Um, but having the physical therapist walk with them, showing them how much better and safer they are, sometimes works. Sometimes it takes a fall, which is like, you know, none of us want that. Although I did read a good book recently called Being Mortal. I don't know if anybody's read this book. Um, I really enjoyed it, but it was a lot about how we all have the right to make poor decisions in our lives. And, <laughs> um, you know, I and that as young people who are worried about our loved ones, our focus is always about safety, safety, safety. When people who are actually in that part of life, their focus is, how can I live? <laughs> <laughs> so... Um, you know, trying to balance all those things is, is tricky. Um, and I, I don't think that there's an easy answer. It's, it just takes time and not, I, you know, I, I don't know. I, I encourage my families, let's like not make it an issue every day. You know what I mean? Like, let's just let it go for a little bit and hopefully they, you know, will come around to the little bit later. I don't know, Lisa, do you have more tips and tricks around this? Well, I let it go. I let it go. I, yeah, no, I, she I has. Just... <laughs> Sorry. No, it's okay, Daniela. Daniela has heard everything that I have to say uh, threefold. Um, she's probably sick of my voice, but, you know, it, it, part no. of it's it's hard. There's, Mara's right. There's no right way. Believe me, there is plenty of patients that we can convince, but it's not that we did anything or said anything correctly. It just I, you know, I don't know, the stars aligned and they found the safety in it or the comfort in it. And so they started to use it on a regular basis. Um, I, I know this family has done everything that we've ever suggested to try to encourage him to use uh, devices. Um, some of the thing, the barriers that I find is if these devices are introduced, uh, maybe a little bit later and there's some cognitive decline and some of that, then it can be really tricky for them to figure out how to navigate some of these things. Like the fancy one that's at UC Davis has breaks and that can be really hard for people to sort of remember to use or how to use it. Um, the remembering just to use it is sometimes really hard. So like sometimes families, what we tell them to do is like put, leave it in the family room or right next to the you know, the lounge chair that they sit in so that they see it more regularly and sort of get used to having it be there. Just seeing it does not necessarily mean that they will put their hands around it and use it. Um, <laughs> but it might be something that works for someone. Um, anyways, Daniela, you know, you've done it all. Um, yeah, I, I, I know. So for me, it's uh, uh, most of the time the decisions are bad. And I learned not to get upset when there is a bad decision. And then if something happens, he he doesn't even realize, you know, that this happened because of his decision. I mean, right now the cognitive, even though he's mobile, the cognitive decline is more pronounced 
right now he can't even put his hotspot on to go on the internet. A few years ago, he could still write a two words text. Now he cannot. So, and and he's mid stage, um, and but it seems that the cognitive decline decline is more pronounced. So more impactful and, on his and 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 I can't I can't make him um, do things. <laughs> yeah, and that's exactly yeah. right. You bring up a great point that caregivers do have to, as as we like to say, or I like to say, is pick your battles or pick your hill that you're going to climb. Um, safety, of course, is important, but the bottom line is we're human beings and we walk on two feet and sometimes we are not going to land on our feet and we are going to fall. And you can't prevent every single fall. What you do is you try to be as safe as possible and make your environment as safe as possible. So moving, you know, um, coffee tables or, or, or lifting up rugs or different things that might be sort of risk, fall risk mm -hmm. hazards. You want to remove those so that you're not contributing to the fall problem. Um, yeah. and you offer the walker and if they use it, fantastic. Uh, if they don't use it, you know, then it's like you've done is try to figure out how you can sort of be okay with the poor decisions, even though it's really frustrating and challenging um, to sort of not get upset about those things. Um, it, it takes some very, you know, a lot of deep breathing, I'm sure, and mindfulness and practice every single day right not to get annoyed by some right. of these things yeah i i hope because this uh vintage house it's uh it needs a lot of repairs i can't uh move him in there right away i can only move my health coaching office in there but once we are able to move him in there it's going to be very nice because it doesn't have stairs has open space and it's it's really, it's, it's different. It has uh, true hardwood floors where we are not going to put any carpets. Well, I didn't put any carpet uh, in, in here, but we do have some tarps for the dog because now the dog gets old and senile and he's peeing and pooping at <laughs> my door on the carpet. <laughs> yeah that's another presentation <laughs> i know i know so okay yeah. i don't want to take uh yeah i just other i just advanced the slides because i figured there might be some of the things that we were already talking about kind of kind of to reference on this slide um if anything and what i should have done probably at the bottom here which i should for the next time we do this is to just put like the palliative kind of way um, the palliative phrase that we use is often meeting people where they are. And every time I say that, there's a part of me that also relaxes. <laughs> so I hope you all, you know, try to use that phrase when you're thinking about, you know, yourself or your loved one, when you are really encountering a problem that doesn't have an easy solution, right? Especially, right, if the person um, that you're caring for, right, may or may not have, you know, as much insight to what is going on from the outside perspective. Um, we can do all these kinds of things. We can think about physical therapy, occupational therapy. We can even invite them into the home to make sure that home environment is as safe as possible, like Daniela was mentioning, getting rid of rugs, changing the position of different furniture, just making sure that if and when people do take a spill, that they're not as harmed as, as they could be. Um, there's also kinds of medical interventions. Again, like I said, if the chorea really is at fault, we could treat that. And then again, thinking about the pros and cons of these devices. For many of the people I work with, right, they might tell me, more important than than anything right now is how I see myself. And if that person is independent, a go-getter, right? Um, someone who's full of um, tenacity, who can overcome anything without relying on anything, right? Then 
I have to also just accept, right, the pros of them not using the walkers that they still feel like they're manifesting that part of themselves. And for that, for that person, that's a powerful pro, right? And we have to weigh that against the safety aspects. I'm going to skip over the spiritual piece because we didn't get to it quite as much. But for many people, the ability to be as mobile as possible might be rooted in their ability to be present in certain communities. And so for those particular kind of maybe social or spiritual or existential practices that people have, I will prioritize special plans for them to still be able to access that in whatever way we can think of, even when they start developing issues with following, uh, with falling. I'm bringing us down to our last case of the night. This will be weight loss and I'll just read it through to take us through to the end. Sam's weight has slowly been changing over the past two years. Over the past six months, Sam unintentionally lost eight pounds. Sam has not been exercising more and Sam's appetite is still as good as ever. Sam even likes to snack several times a day in addition to her three meals. Sam's neurologist has suggested seeing a nutritionist. Sam worries that the Korea is making them lose weight faster. Sam has not noticed any changes to swallowing, though their partner has noticed some coughing with drinking water. Weight loss is another big question mark, a big topic of conversation um, for um, people and families living with Huntington's disease. And some of the factors that we might think about to start at the very end of that stem, that story, are there swallowing changes that could be explaining some of the weight loss? It doesn't seem like Sam's appetite has changed very much, but certainly if they're having swallowing issues and are just not able to eat as quickly and not finishing their meals as much, could that be kind of in the background and leading to their weight loss? Um, dietary choices, again, very commonly change um, in the course of Huntington's disease. People can start to crave certain things that they didn't used to crave before. Um, so that can also impact weight. Um, people can also develop changes in appetite. This is not an issue for Sam, but it's very common for people at some point in time in their journey with a serious illness to notice a waning appetite. So that can definitely naturally lead to weight loss. Korea. Um, Korea itself is that extra movement that many people have in Huntington's disease. And if you think about it, you're burning a few calories probably every minute of the day that you're having Korea. So there is this kind of increased metabolic kind of load that we know that people living with Huntington's have, um, even when their chorea is actually well controlled, but we do think the chorea is contributing a little bit too. So they just burn through calories faster. At the end of the day, kind of with that increased metabolic load, that increased metabolism that people have due to Huntington's disease, we can just see weight changes that are related to that. And the palliative care approach to weight loss, um, as you can probably guess, we want to take a look of all of those things that I listed. So we might look at their swallow in more detail. We might try to look at their diet, see are they restricting themselves because of texture preferences or anything? Is that what's leading to the weight loss? Maybe having them work with a nutritionist to try to make sure they're getting as much vitamins and nutrition in whatever they are eating. Um, there are medications that some people try to help boost appetite to see if it can help people gain back weight that they've not wanted to lose. Um, this, I would say, is a pretty careful discussion between you and your family, your neurologist, um, because there are pros and cons to all those medications, and they're all kind of a mixed bag. We can definitely try to suppress the chorea more to make sure you're burning a few calories throughout the day if your neurologists think that the chorea is uncontrolled enough that it really accounts for the weight loss. And then again, big picture wise, always like starting and ending the conversation about weight, about what are our kind of goals and hopes um, and expectations in terms of the weight loss. Um, 
weight is a number, but it can also reflect how we look. And when people see themselves losing weight, that can have an impact on how healthy they see themselves. Um, it can be um, an indicator that they're having difficulty swallowing and therefore having more difficulty participating in mealtime with their family. Is that what we're talking about? That ritual of having a meal together? Um, there are many different ways to think about eating, to think about swallowing, to think about weight, and they're all kind of deeply tied together. Um, so whenever I talk to my you know, patient and they mentioned, I'm just worried about my weight. You know, my hope is that you'll be able to work with, you know, a team or a palliative care specialist or whomever that asks you to just tell me more because there might be a more that's unveiled there to, to help create goals in the context of weight loss that, that makes sense in the, in the setting of your illness. That brings us to the end of our presentation today. I just put this up there to, again, try to emphasize that we try to take a holistic approach to symptoms. And we've covered just a few today and just even covered a few ways of managing them, that there are many other kinds of integrative and even spiritual techniques to really treat many of the symptoms that we discussed today. I also put up here, again, a map just to show at least the Bay Area because that's where I'm located. Um, but there are many, many wonderful Bay Area palliative care resources. And at the end of the day, if you would like to be connected to a palliative care team, that link at the bottom, getpalliativecare.org, will help you put in your zip code and help you locate a palliative care team around you anywhere in the United States. Our next webinar, We'll cover what to expect as HD in, enters its later stages. We will talk about the differences between palliative care and hospice. We'll talk about what can hospice offer you and what to expect when transitioning from palliative care to hospice. And I put this up again just to emphasize hospice is only a small part of what palliative care does, which is why we're devoting you know, one of the series to talking about that in more detail. This is the QR code again for the replay for part one in case you wanted to see it. And I'll leave this here as well. This is the registration code for part three, our next series. We're gonna focus on late stage HD symptoms. And again, think about transition to hospice and um, what to think about at that period of time in you or your loved one's lives. That will be on November 19th, 6 p.m. again, uh, Pacific time. And as a teaser, um, I put up the flyer for part four, um, which I'm really excited to attend um, because I get to meet Dr. Garoni, who I've only heard amazing things about, who will lead the conversation uh, focusing on end-of-life questions, challenges, and resources. Um, and that will be in the new year in 2025 on January 28th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. You said that was November what? Here we go. Back to this page, November 19th. November 19th. Thank you all for all of your kind attention and your participation and your wisdom. Um, we do have a minute or two to take any questions if there are any um, that people have at this time. We had someone said, thank you so much to all of you. Very helpful. I also agree that we had some great discussions um, or talks. Hold on, let me unpin us. <laughs> If anyone wants to unmute themselves and ask a question, we can do that for the remaining. Um, I think Daniela asks. Oh, yes, yes, I, I put it in the chat. 
<laughs> yeah. I, when you see, say... This is a great, this is a great uh, thing because um, I, I found that it's very expensive. I mean, everything about HD is very expensive. And now he finally got on SSDI and Medicare. And the only Medicare that we can get is original Medicare because the other Medigap and Advantage and so on, they are not covering this kind of illness and this kind of uh, um, is not covering UC Davis. So original Medicare, this means that we pay 20% 20 20 of the cost of everything that we get. I mean, it's it's much better to be covered and pay 20% rather than not cover at all and pay the full price all the time. But with this palliative care, with all these professionals, and then with hospice, um, we intend to do this at home. That's why I bought that vintage house because no nursing home wanted to take him. No nursing home wants to take this illness. Uh, and can I, I can have skilled nurses and people coming at home. Now, I know Medicare pays some of it, but most of it because this is a long, long uh, illness. <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> so Medi uh, UC Davis will take his regular Medicare. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, it does only, Medicare does only cover 80%. Um, talk to, but I'll talk to you offline there anyways. All right. Okay. I'll talk to you offline about it, but, um, just on the details for your specific situation, but mm -hmm. Medicare does also cover hospice as well as palliative care services. Finding outpatient palliative care services is the little bit harder part, but if you go to the get palliative care, uh, is it .org? .org. Okay. .org. I wrote it down. Yeah. Yeah. If you go to there, you can type in your, I think it's your zip code, or maybe you just type in your city and it will pop up a bunch mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> but it'll pop up the palliative care options that are around you. Some of them are virtual and those um, are can be very beneficial as well. And you can do it from the comfort of your own home, especially if mobility mm -hmm. or leaving the house is, is difficult. So if you do need, you know, um, you can try that first. Um, if you need a referral, obviously you can talk to your primary care doctor or your Huntington's team to get those referrals done uh, for you to um, talk to a palliative care specialist. Yeah, speaking of the primary care doctor, even though now for four years, the doctor knows he has HD, every single time when we go, he gives him Alzheimer test <laughs> and he knows what day it is. I said, oh, he's doing better. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, gotta give you something to laugh about, right? The primary care <laughs> doctor always forgets <laughs> what it is. <laughs> well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Sometimes for coming. you have a lot more wisdom than some medical professionals might have, right? About your loved one's particular journey and and what they're experiencing. So I, I'll just ascribe it to your own wisdom. <laughs> it was lovely to see all of you this evening and thank you again to Mara and Lisa for co-hosting with me I couldn't do it without them <laughs> we're delighted you're doing this and it's yes. so great that we have these recordings for people to listen to now too absolutely so um Jocelyn is usually quicker than me but she will get that me that recording as soon as she can you know find it on her computer because sometimes it goes crazy places um, and then we will work on getting that posted and then we will add that QR code to that flyer so that people can see part one and part two. And then, of course, uh, we'll send out emails about uh, part three and four. Um, and as always, if you guys have questions or concerns, please reach out to me. I will put my email in the chat. Um, Alice, I know you don't live in California but you're welcome to reach out as well if you have any questions or concerns. And if I don't know the answer for you, I can usually find someone near you that might. Um, but please feel free to email me and we're happy to support you and get you um, resources you need to put to help you, you know, navigate this journey. So we're in this together. Absolutely. Thank you all and have a very wonderful evening.
Good night, everybody. Good night, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye.